Okay, so um, we've talked about the, the critical importance of being able to positively identify an individual. And that goes for a lot of different circumstances, but especially for um, the victim of a, a killing. Uh, we want to make sure we can identify the individual or the victim that has been killed. But we also want to be able to positively identify the person that did the killing. And that's more uh, what we're going to use the idea of fingerprint identification for. Although certainly, um, if we have an unknown victim, uh, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to take the victim's fingerprints. If the victim's fingerprints are available, uh, I'm sure you've seen cases where the, the murderer uh, actually removed the fingers from the individual so that they couldn't identify them using um, fingerprints. And you're aware that we can also use dental records to try and identify people. Uh, we'll talk about that later on as well. But uh, for the most part, part, fingerprint identification is used to try and identify people that were uh, at the scene. Uh, the, the single most important thing that we can do to uh, convict a criminal is place them at the scene. That's going to be uh, one of the, the highest priorities of things that we have. And so the way that we did that initially, um, and Emily, can I get you to shut that door for me? The way that we did that initially was based on something called anthropometry. Okay, anthropometry. Uh, in 1883, French police expert Alphonse Bertillon introduced the first quantitative method or scientific method that tried to identify humans. And his system was based on the knowledge that bone size doesn't change after the age of 20. Okay, you really don't change much after the age of 20. And he thought that skeletal systems were so diverse that it wouldn't be possible for any two people to have exactly the same body measurements. That doesn't seem reasonable to me. I think it's entirely possible for more than one person to have the same body measurements. But what he did, and you don't need to know the details of this, you just need to understand the concept. Um, for each individual, the assessment consisted of three components. There was a detailed description of the individual. There were full length and full pro profile photographs, and then a precise set of body measurements to the nearest millimeter. Okay, and right away you can hopefully see the, the biggest problem with this, how easy is it to measure things to the nearest millimeter? I've got a meter stick here, and you know, is my arm 50 millimeters long or is it 49 millimeters long? You know, right. it's it's going to depend entirely on who's measuring it and uh, how how um, how invested they are in the process. You can certainly imagine that if you had to spend your day measuring people's body parts that you might lose focus after a while, right? So anyway, this is just a list of the things that they, they did uh, and, the, and the instructions. Uh, and you don't, again, have to know these. You just have to understand that there was this precise set of body measurements. Um, and so they, they measured the height. And there were instructions on how to do these things. Uh, the outer arm stretch, the trunk length, the head length, the width, the right cheek uh, measurement. So this is interesting. Measure from the right, the side of the right nostril to the side of the face. Uh, the right ear measure from the top of the right ear to the bottom. You know, and these instructions are vague enough that that one person's going to do it differently than another person. Uh, so uh, right ear, left foot, left middle finger, left little finger, left forearm. And then we would come up with a list of these different measurements, and we'd keep it on a paper card, and we would use things like rulers and calipers to make these measurements. Okay, So you can imagine 
that there was a lot of variability in how these things were taken. But this system of identification was accurate enough that once assessed, the criminal's measurements could be used to positively identify them upon subsequent encounters with law enforcement. That's assuming that they committed a crime in the same vicinity that they had their measurements taken in. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to distribute these measurements on these cards to uh, a large number of uh, other police forces? Or in, in 1890, how difficult would it have been in San Francisco to get these measurements from uh, a person in New York City? So a lot of these things in this day and age don't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, but Bertillon's measurements were used widely to catalog criminal identities for 20 to 30 years, and it was the only way that we really had to figure out uh, a, a positive identification. But in the early 1900s, fingerprints rapidly replaced the system of identification. Um, there are some names that you need to be familiar with related to the story of how fingerprints developed as a, a law enforcement technique. So we probably have the first recorded incidents, or instance of this in 1858, and there was a Scotsman named William Herschel, and he wanted to, he wasn't looking to use this as a forensic thing, he was wanting to uh, figure out uh, whether signatures were from the correct person or not. And so he was a civil servant Indian in India, and he required palm prints as a means of identifying people on contracts to prevent the individual from denying their signature was on the contract at a later date. And that sounds like a reasonable thing to do, right? He wanted to make sure that people weren't, weren't going to try and defraud their government. And he figured out eventually that he only really needed fingerprints and he also later used these as a means of preventing prevention fraud and as a way to make certain that the jail sentences of certain criminals uh, was carried out by the actual criminal. But he never really used this as a uh, in a way to try to catch criminals. But this is an example of his um, uh, fingerprinting technique from... Uh, 1859. So as early as almost 200 years ago, we were able to start to do this. And short time later, another Scotsman, Henry Fault, um, had been working in Japan, and he started noticing fingerprints that had been present on pieces of pottery, and he began investigating their possible forensic use, and he published a letter in the scientific journal Nature, that's a scientific journal that's still around today. It's a very famous journal, and it's uh, highly reputable. And uh, he published this in 1880, and he tried to get Scotland Yard to use this in 1886. But Scotland Yard said, you know what, we've got this better method, Bertillon's method of anthropometry, which is ridiculous, right? Uh, and they turned him down. Now, as sometimes happens in science, Falds told someone else about his idea. And this is a, a lesson. If you're a scientist, you don't tell other people about your ideas unless you trust them implicitly to not go take your idea and steal it. But he talked to Charles Darwin. Obviously, you know who Darwin is. Um, and Darwin then discussed it with somebody named Francis Galton, and Galton took this idea and stole it. And he went to Scotland Yard just two years after Falls did and said, hey, I've got this great thing. I've got this fingerprint thing. And he said that Herschel had been the first to suggest a forensic use for the fingerprinting, which is not true. And this led to some confrontation. Um, uh, Herschel and Falls engaged in an argument then, each claiming the idea of, of the use of fingerprinting for identifying criminals. Uh, 
but Herschel ultimately agreed that he wasn't the one that wanted to use this for uh, a finger, uh, forensic use. It was Falls that wanted to, and by that time, Galton had already scooped him, okay? Because he published his book, which is the original reference on fingerprinting, fingerprints in 1892. So we've had this for about 120 years now. This established Galton. And so Galton is the name that you really need to remember here. Galton is the original expert in fingerprinting and falls But Galton's book was based on a study of 8,000 fingerprints. And he provided a classification that we still use today. Um, we assigned three patterns to types of fingerprints that we're going to call loops and arches and whorls. Okay? So you, you may or may not have heard these terms before. But that's not the only problem here. We, we want to identify these fingerprints, but we've got to be able to file them in some way that I can go and find out whose fingerprints are what. Can you imagine trying to match a set of fingerprints to some criminal when all you have are these paper representations of, yeah, I have a question. So is it still necessary to learn like all the different uh, types of fingerprints, that sort of thing, that it just would be computerized and in a system like that? So if you want to, there's still enough of an art to it that, yeah, you need to, you need to understand the, the ins and outs of, of the different types of patterns and the, the fine details, uh, because at least at this point, um, there's still a need for some individual to actually confirm that yes, these two sets of fingerprints actually match. Okay, so even though you see on NCIS where um, um, you know Abby in the lab is is pulling up the sets of fingerprints and then you've got this match here, um, there's still enough wiggle room that uh, it it is still required that an expert confirms that these are a match. Okay. okay? So, and, and I can't predict how long that's going to be the case. It may be in 10 years that no human needs to look at a, a human fingerprint, you know. Uh, and, and there are probably other things that are going to take the place of that. Uh, retina scans, uh, you know, things like that are also uh, other kinds of biometric uh, facial recognition software um, that we uh, have the ability to to actually carry out, uh, had, did any of you watch the show uh, Person of Interest? Okay, Person of Interest, we have that ability right now to do that. Uh, the computer capability isn't there yet, but the, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be that long before somebody writes a computer program that, uh, or a, a set of computer software that, that tracks pretty much everything we do. Okay. So anyway, at least for the time being, though, that's a really good question. We need experts to be able to look at that. So you you could wonder though, is if if is becoming a fingerprint expert um, uh, a dead end job? Uh, it may be. Okay. So it's a it's a good thing to be able to classify these things, but we've got to have some way to store them so that we can actually use them and match them. Uh, for the, the first 80 years of this, all we were able to do is have these things available to us on some kind of, of medium that we could look at and compare to uh, the criminal. And that was still a difficult thing to do. So both the, the, the patterns that we recognize as well as the ability to make them useful were two separate things, and, and they're both important in this process. Okay, so some way to file these things so we can retrieve them was the next challenge, and this was accomplished uh, in a couple of ways. Um, in 1891, Dr. Juan Vucetich, 
uh, an Argentinian police officer created a system uh, that most Spanish-speaking countries still use around the world today. And then the other name that you, you should remember in addition to Galton is Richard Henry. Um, he described a system that's still used by most English-speaking countries. So Bertillon wasn't long for continuing to be used. His system was continued to be used even as more and more law enforcement agencies started to say, yeah, we believe in fingerprinting. And the fatal blow, blow for Bertillon, his procedure only lasted for a couple of decades. Um, it was unable to distinguish two individuals. A criminal named Will West was sent to prison and his measurements were taken. Unfortunately, already housed at the same prison was another inmate, inmate named William West, whose anthropomorphic and other physical features were identical those to those of Will West. The two were indistinguishable, okay? They could be separated, but fingerprinting only separated them. So that was kind of like the final nail of the coffin for that. So, 1904, American law enforcement agencies started to receive training from Scotland Yard. And in 1924, the newly established FBI began collecting and recording fingerprints, and theirs is currently the largest in the world. Okay? So, how do we do this? So, one of the big things we had to figure out was that fingerprints are definitely unique. There is no ind two individuals, there are no two individuals that have the exact same fingerprints, okay? And we have had to figure out based on anatomic studies that this is actually the case. Galton originally placed the odds of two individuals having exactly the same fingerprints as one in 64 billion. Obviously, we don't have that many people in the world, so and there's never been that many people in the world, so Improved mathematical models continue to support the estimate that no two individuals will have the same fingerprint. More importantly, our understanding of our experience of over 50 million fingerprints has supported the fact that we've never had two individuals that have had the same fingerprints. Okay, so the first principle, and you need to know these principles, the first principle is the fingerprint is an individual characteristic. What's my other type of characteristic? Class. Class information, right? Class characteristics versus individual characteristics. I will positively be identified by my fingerprint. So, how do we get our fingerprints? The fingerprint is the result of the presence on our fingertips of structures called friction ridges. Okay, The pattern of ridges that appears on our fingertips provides for an extra degree of friction. I'm sure you've had the experience of trying to hold on to something when your fingers are wet. You lose that friction, right? And you don't realize how critical those are until you have sort of lost that ability uh, and I've, I've always wondered, uh, I mean, this, this really is a significant thing. I've always wondered on Men in Black, after they have their fingerprints removed, how it is that they're able to, like, hold on to their guns or, or other things when they don't have fingerprints. Uh, so and I could just see Bill, Will Smith going, ah, as he, his fingerprints are removed. Uh, so... It's difficult to know whether this is true or not because we're never in a situation when we don't have these ridges unless you're on men in black. But what you can do is you can test this using a laptop trackpad. If you try to move the trackpad with any smoother part of your skin, you can't do it. Okay? So there's a distinct ability there uh, that your friction ridges uh, supply to you. Okay? So. The underlying anatomy of the skin is what causes this. I don't need you to really know the underlying anatomy of the skin. I just want you to be aware that the anatomy of the skin is what gives rise to this 
type of pattern. So in the skin, the layer of functional protection cells right here, these cells, uh, these layers of cells, and there's 20 or 30 layers of cells here, or even more, or fingertips. These layers of cells are the protective layer of cells, and they rest on connective tissue underlying the, the epithelium. So this is called epithelium. These are epithelial cells. And underlying this is a connective tissue, and the connective tissue grows even from the time of an infant uh, in, in this way where we have these ridges of connective tissue that push up into the skin. Okay, so these ridges of connective tissue push up into the, the epithelium like this, and we have a, a couple of different types of ridges. We have a primary ridge, and we have a secondary ridge that develops here, and your friction ridge overlies this primary ridge, and then the trough here overlies this secondary ridge. Okay. Also, within the primary ridge, we have sweat glands. And these sweat glands create little pores on the surface of your skin. And this actually is a significant thing. It, it creates little dots in your fingerprint pattern. If you look closely enough, these pores are uh, important in part of the fingerprinting process. So the diagram above, several of the anatomic features of the skin are present. First, it's separated into two layers. Okay, This upper layer is called the epidermis. This is called the dermis. Epa means next to. So it should make sense that this is next to the dermis. Dermis simply means layer. This is the layer that's next to the layer. Okay. So the dermis is the supportive layer. It's made up of mostly structural proteins, collagen. The epidermis is composed of layers of tightly interlocking cells called squamous epithelial cells. And these contain keratin, which protect and shield against intrusion in the body. But the junction between the dermis and epidermis is wavy. And this is because connective tissue ridges extend up into the lower layers of the epithelium. Okay, and uh, the, the correct term for this is a dermal papilla. Okay, so a papilla is something that pushes up into the structure. So it's pushing up into the overlying epithelium here. And I have another one next door. Pushing up into. So these are dermal papillae. And this comes from the word uh, papilla, which means small protrusion. Okay, so we have primary and secondary ridges overlying the primary ridge. The skin is pushed up into a friction ridge. Overlying the secondary ridge, the skin is pulled down into a valley. And then we've also mentioned the pores of the sweat glands. Okay, so this actually occurs during fetal life. Okay. So I've given you a reference to an article, I think, and it discusses the development of the friction ridge pattern during fetal life and the features of fetal growth that give rise to the uniqueness of this pattern. So we've actually established as uh, an anatomic study why these things are unique. Okay? This gives rise to the development of a number of features called ridge characteristics. Okay, so we have ridge characteristics, and the following diagram shows the nature of each of the important ridge characteristics. You're not going to need to know all of these, but you are going to need to know some of these, and we'll talk about which, which are the really important ones. So you can see that there's a variety of features of these ridges. I can have a core going up into uh, this ridge that overlaps it. I can have a ridge ending. I can have a short ridge. I can have a fork. This is called a delta because it reminds people of the Greek letter delta. This is called a hook. This is called an eye, a dot, or an island. 
which is where a sweat gland is. Uh, sometimes you can get crossovers or bridges or enclosures. And then something that you have that's not one of these other things is called a specialty. Okay, so let's see how some of these features work. Okay, uh, each friction ridge contains a row of select gland pores. These can be seen as tiny holes along each friction ridge. So when an individual touches an object, these sweat glands have released sweat and oil, and even though you can't really see that, right? When you rub your hand, your thumb over your fingers, you don't feel oily unless you've just moved your, or you've just uh, applied a layer of like a, some kind of a, a soap or some kind of a, uh, a skid cream or something like that. But sweat and oils from the skin are transferred from the skin to the object in the pattern of the friction ridges, okay? And we have even been able to lift fingerprints from things like carpet fibers before. So this pattern is really, really, really consistent and very, very uh, useful. We've developed ways to, to be able to lift these patterns from a lot of different places. Normally these prints are not visible to the naked eye. When I put my hand, my fingerprint on my board here, I can't see my fingerprints. Nevertheless, I would be able to lift fingerprints from the board like that. When I put uh, fingerprints on a piece of paper, okay, I leave fingerprints on the piece of paper and we would be able to lift fingerprints if we were specialized enough we could do that. Okay, so by the way, if you're using your phone right now, I'd really appreciate it if you put it away. So because we can't see these, these are called latent prints, and this is an important term, latent prints. Okay, so latent prints are prints that need to be um, um, lifted in some way or, or made visible in some way to the naked eye and we'll learn about the different ways to do that. But if you look at these ridges here in this particular fingerprint, you can see all of these tiny little holes here. And this is where all of the sweat gland openings are. So we really do have the ability to see all of these tiny little pores or sweat glands on our fingertips, okay? So this diagram here has pointed out some of the types of things that we can see. So right here, there's a bifurcation. You can see it's splitting, or it's also called a fork. You can see it's splitting into two different things here. Um, right here is a ridge end. That ridge ends right there. Um, right here, although you can't see it very well, oh, right here, there's an enclosure. Is it delta thing? Whoa. Right here? Oh, no, I thought that like triangle was a delta. 11 looks like a delta to me. It does kind of look like a delta, doesn't it? Okay. Oh, um, yeah, I know what it is. Four is a ridge ending, five is a, a bifurcation. Let's see, right there is, is a bifurcation. Uh, six is a bifurcation right here is a bifurcation. Uh, seven is a, a bifurcation. It splits into two right there. Um, eight is a ridge ending. Uh, nine is a ridge ending. Ten is a short ridge. So right there is a short ridge. Um, so we've got all of these different things. And this is a comparison of one of these prints and another print lifted from a different situation. So this would be the fingerprint that is collected directly and put on the, the little fingerprint card, right? And this might be the 
print at the crime scene uh, that you're comparing it to. So you would look to see if you could see all of these different distinguishing marks. Okay. So in order for a fingerprint to be considered a match, the individual rich characteristics must be identical in both type and location. For an individual fingerprint, there may be as many as 150 or more specific ridge characteristics, right? We can identify all kinds of ridge characteristics for each fingerprint, but anywhere from 8 to 16 matching points. That's all they need. 8 to 16 matching points are considered to be adequate for identification. An agreed upon exact number has never been satisfactorily decided upon and whether or not the match is exact can become an expert witness battle. Okay, so um, your question then, Isaac, becomes pretty important, doesn't it? Do I still need people to actually do this? Uh, people are going to be the ones that are, are going to compete in, in court, right? My expert versus your expert uh, says, well, I want to see 12 ridge characteristics that match uh, you only need to see eight. Uh, my, my statement is I can't say for sure that's an exact match because I don't see 12 ridge characteristics. Okay. Okay, so the first principle is, though, that the fingerprint is an individual class piece of information, right? Second principle is that a fingerprint remains unchanged during the individual's lifetime. Okay, that's kind of important, isn't it? If my fingerprints changed over time, that would be a huge problem for identifying things. So it's been found that the association of friction ridges with a specific pattern of primary and secondary ridges remains constant throughout life. Attempts to obscure fingerprint patterns using corrosives don't usually alter the fingerprint. They only end up adding additional features due to scarring that make identification even easier. So if you try to obscure your fingerprints, unless you literally melt all of your skin away from your hands and it's not going to grow back, you are, are not going to obscure enough information that you can't be identified. And if you do alter your hands in that way, you're going to make it almost impossible not to identify you, right? Hey, there's that guy that's got the scarred hand because he poured acid all over it trying to alter his fingerprints. Just wear gloves. Huh? Just wear gloves? Yeah. Okay, that would be easier, wouldn't it? Third principle is that fingerprints have general ridge patterns that permit them to be systematically classified, okay? I not only can identify individual characteristics, I can make it so that I can easily classify them and therefore make it easy for me to say a person across the country is that person uh, by transferring that information from one place to another. Okay. So, what we're going to find out, and you can actually look at your own fingerprints um, if you don't need to wear glasses like I do, um, yeah, I, would, I would need to look at mine under a magnifying glass because my eyes are bad enough. But uh, we have these three different types of patterns here that we described before. We stated before, come on, we have arches, we have loops, and we have whorls. Okay, so let's describe these. An arch pattern is the least common of patterns. 5% of the population has an arch pattern. And the interesting thing about fingerprints is, is that just because you have one pattern on one finger, that doesn't mean you don't have a different pattern on another finger. Okay? So a lot of times you'll have mixtures of these different types of patterns. So arch pattern is, a, is the least common type. These are divided into two groups. The general structure is that the ridges enter one side of the print, rise near the central part of the print, and then descend 
exiting the opposite side of the print. If the ascending and descending parts of the ridge are shallow, this is a plain arch. If it's spiked, it's a tented arch. Okay, so notice my ridge lines enter one side and exit the other side. Okay, and that's consistent throughout the entire fingerprint. My, my lines enter one side and they exit the other side. My lines enter one side, they exit the other side. If I have a shallow arch, that's called a plain arch. If I have a spiked arch in the center, I have a tented arch. Okay. Whorls are present in 30 to 35% of the population and consist of four different types. Okay, so I've got a plain whorl here, and we describe the plain whorl as being when one or more ridges form a complete circle pattern around the center. Okay? I've got a complete circle around the center. Okay, my ridges form complete circles around the center. If I have a whorl in the center formed in the middle of a loop pattern, then I've got something called a central pocket loop. Okay, so I've got a central pocket loop here, um, and that's formed in the middle of a whorl pattern. So here's the, the kind of whorl pattern around it, and here's that central pocket. Okay, so I've, I've got a, a whorl in the center of a looped pattern, central pocket loop. I've got a whorl in the center of a looped pattern, and we'll describe what that looped pattern here is in a second. Um, in the double loop whorl, uh, wow, I need to be able to spell them. I think where's the two loops are present in one impression. Uh, and then in the accidental whorl, there is a mixture of two different types of patterns, so it looks like a mistake. Okay, so in a double loop whorl, I have two loop patterns here. Okay, I've got two loop patterns here. It almost looks like a yin and a yang sign, doesn't it? So you can kind of remember that that way. I've got a double loop whorl here. And then this, huh? That one's on my thumb. Is it? Cool. So you're already starting to look at your hands, right? And then an accidental whorl is where it looks like the circle was an accident because it, it's not complete. Okay, and then just loops make up 60 to 65 percent of the population. A loop is a pattern where the ridge enters from one side of the print, recurves back on itself, and then leaves the same side of the print. Okay, so it loops back on itself, so it starts on one side loops back on itself and leaves the same side. Okay, starts on one side, loops back on itself and leaves the same side. Starts on one side, loops back on itself and leaves the same side. And so we've got some descriptors here that you're familiar with these terms, okay? If the loop opens towards the little finger, it's called an owner loop. Okay, so if I've got a loop that's doing this, and that's toward the little finger, remember your standard anatomic position, your little finger is towards the ulna, right? The ulna's on the inside, the ulna's medial. Yeah, it means close. Okay, 
So if it's towards the outside, it's a radial loop. Okay? So these terms are important. Okay? So you'll need to be aware of these patterns. Would you call it if there's like a combination of two? So like on one of my fingers, it looks like I have an ulnar loop and a tended arch on top of each other. Okay. Um, you would. I have, Dr. Marshall. What's that? I don't know what I have. You would probably call that an accidental whirl. Uh, so anything that that, that looks like you've got two mixtures of patterns is going to be called a. Okay. So here's. Here's how we use this. What about this one? Using this classification alone, the fingerprints of everyone in the world could only be subdivided into 1,024 categories. Although each person's prints are individual, being able to put them into one of only 1,024 categories is not good enough, right? I'm not going. To, I'm still going to have millions and millions of people in each class, right? I've got billions of people in the world, so if my categories are only categorizing uh, one um, uh, in a thousand, I'm going to have hundreds of millions of people in each class. That's still not going to help me identify the visit. So modifications exist which allow for a much larger number of categories and so easier narrowing down of individuals in each group. So here's how the FBI system works. First, the figures are paired as follows. I pair, I pair my right index finger with my right thumb, my right ring finger with, and you don't need to know this, you would be able to look this up. I would give you this information on a, on a, a test. The presence or absence of a world pattern is the basis for the primary classification. If a world pattern is present on either of the first pair, it's assigned a value of 16. The second pair, a value of 8. The third pair, a value of 4. The fourth pair, a value of 2. And the fifth pair, a value of 1. So if I had a world on both of my little left little finger and my left ring finger, I would say they both have one. If I have a world on my right middle finger, I'm going to say that has a value of eight. If I have a world on my right index finger, I'm going to say that has a value of 16. Okay? So any finger with an arch or a loop is assigned a value of zero. So if I have an arch or a loop on this finger, it gets a value of zero. If I have an arch or a loop on this finger, it gives me a value of zero. Okay? All values of all ten fingers are obtained. A one is added to both the numerator and the denominator, and I get uh, a value. So suppose the right index finger and the right middle finger are whirls. All the rest are loops or arches. So uh, a whirl and a whirl. All the rest of these are loops or arches. And then I add a value of one to each of these, and I get my final value. This provides a much greater number of categories. About 25% of the population is a 1-1. One, one. And if I have all zeros, all zeros, that means all loops. That's me. You have all loops? Yeah. Okay. So it's kind of interesting, isn't it? We have to mirror each other. It's kind of interesting. They're the same. Well, four, a fourth of us will have that, right? No. Yeah. No. No. Okay, so any questions so far? Pretty sure I'm all after that. Oh, yeah? yeah? So you would be a very, very rare, you would be very easy to identify. Don't don't commit crimes. I'm all I think about it. I perhaps, I, 
Or wear gloves, right? Yeah. <laughs> or get the fingerprints of someone else and paste them on your fingers and or just close your neck. Okay. Or wear gloves. Okay. So how do we do this? Trying to identify fingerprints as belonging to a specific individual. Analysts use a process that goes by the acronym ACEB. Okay? Analysis, comparison, evaluation, and verification. ACEB. This is especially important for us as we think about uh, the, the state test at the final at the end of the year and as we think about the POSA competition. This will always be asked about in the, the, the test. In the analysis, all information present in the fingerprint is evaluated at three levels of detail. Okay, in the analysis, this is the first part of it, HV. In the analysis, all information present in the fingerprint is evaluated at three levels of detail. The first degree, ridge flow, the basic pattern is observed to identify which of the eight types of ridge pattern are present. Okay, so the first degree means that I'm going to identify which of these eight types of patterns is present. So ridge flow, that's what this means. Which of those is present? Okay. The second degree, ridge detail. Analyzing the detail focuses on three ridge characteristics, bifurcations, ridge endings, and dots. Okay. These are the three main details in ridge uh, information that we're going to talk about. And it's the dots that were the, the pores of the uh, the um, sweat glands. These are also called points. So when you see the, the computer screen and all of the different uh, details appear and there's a line to that one and a line to that one and a line to that one and the computer screen shows that, these are all called points. Okay? The analysis includes determination of the relationship of each point to surrounding points by counting the number of ridges between these points. Now, you can imagine that would be really difficult to do by hand, okay? I'm not going to take a... So what are you looking at there, Isaac? What? What are you... No. Okay? You look like you had your phone there. No. Okay. So, you can imagine that if I have a, for example, like a, a bifurcation here, and I have a bunch of ridge lines between that and a ridge ending right here. For me to sit there and try to count the number of ridges between that and that and mark that down somehow would be incredibly difficult. So this didn't really take off super fast until we have computers that can just simply look at this and count the number of ridges with the computer program. So we've got these complex computer algorithms that do all of this for us now. Um, but if you were an expert witness, you would have to have an understanding of how this is accomplished and make sure that you do how to explain that kind of thing in court. Okay, so the analysis includes determination of the relationship of each point to surrounding points by counting the number of ridges between those particular things. Then the third level of detail, ridge path structure, evaluation of individual ridge structures, especially the pores, the ridge widths using quantitative measurements, and any breaks or scarring of individual ridges, and this requires magnification. So I might have some ridges that were this thick, and I might have other ridges that were this thick, but it's going to take a computer to measure that kind of detail for the most part. Okay, so I've got these three degrees of analysis. I'm going to analyze 
the ridge flow. That's the basic pattern. I'm going to analyze especially bifurcations, ridge endings, and dots, and see how they all relate to each other. And then I'm going to identify ridge path structure. Uh, the individual ridge structures. And once I do that, the fingerprint is compared side by side with the print in question. This is the evaluation stage, okay? Mr. Marshall, Dr. Marshall. Yeah, that's what I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh huh. Fine. Karen, you need to go down to the council. Okay. Obviously, you can read the rest of it. Yeah. Okay. 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 So this is the comparison part, right? We analyze. That's the A and the ACV. This is the comparison part. I compare, okay? And then the evaluation stage is the result of the comparison. Identification of the print is a match. It's excluded or it's inconclusive. Verification step involves independent examination by a second examiner. So again, as long as we um, continue to need this kind of a system, um, there will continue to be a need for fingerprint experts. Okay. Now, prior to 1970, this type of analysis required manual comparison and categorization, meaning that fingerprint analysis um, could take days or weeks. However, since 1970, computer systems have become increasingly useful in making this comparison. The computerized system uh, that more efficiently matches fingerprints is called an APHIS, an automated fingerprint system. There are several of these around, but the general term for this is an APHIS, an automated fingerprint identification system. And in 1999, FBI began full implement implementation of IAFIS, the integrated automated fingerprint system. And again, this is the largest fingerprint system in the world. It contains over 50 prints. So you almost can't listen to one of these shows without somebody saying something about IAFIS, right? You, you hear that again and again and again. So what did IAFIS show? Did I get a hit on IAFIS? Okay. So APHIS is where to be, uh, they work by being able to create a digital map of the fingerprint that recognizes ridge ends and bifurcations and their positions relative to each other's. These ridge characteristics are also called minutia. So you might see that term on a, 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 a test. Minutia are ridge ends and bifurcations and dots. Computer search algorithm determines the degree of correlation between the location and relationship of minutia for both the search and file prints. A set of 10 fingerprints can be searched against 1 million fingerprints in about two seconds. Okay? So, my, my uh, crime lab has a set of fingerprints, and they can literally search that set of fingerprints against a set of a million fingerprints in about two seconds. And uh, so it doesn't take very long anymore for those hits to come up. So that's one of the things about these crime shows that's actually true. Um, you know, you see the, the computer sitting there and you see the, the fingerprints flashing by, flashing by, flashing by. That's probably a little bit of drama, but uh, uh, you, you really can get a, a comparison uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the computer can then display the identified minutia of the file fingerprint next to the potentially matching fingerprint. And once the prints that are most likely to be matches are identified, a fingerprint analyst makes the final deter determination as to whether there's a match or no match. And you've seen this kind of thing probably a thousand times on crime shows now, right? Uh, and so the fingerprint analyst still has to be the one that makes the final determination. 
Okay. So this it this says ten twenty, doesn't it? Let's stop there. Okay, and we'll we'll try to get into the lab next time and, and start talking about how we collect fingerprints. Okay. So Monday will be partial discussion, partial let's do something. Laboratory. Yeah, we'll probably just do most of that here. Uh, although for the the part where we're going to uh, lift fingerprints off of the using the 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 smoking, uh, we'll have to use that in the lab. But that'll be after we get back from class uh, from break. Is this some of the stuff that you kind of wanted to learn about? Yeah. Okay. I, I really like this kind of thing. This is cool. Actually, we may watch a, a video describing the different techniques of, of uh, identifying fingerprints. Thank you.